Are you guys ready to go? Yes. yes. Ready. Do you want me to do an introduction or you want to introduce yourself, Doug? Oh, you can do the introduction better. All right. Hey guys, thank you for coming to another exciting uh, lecture here. Uh, today we're going to have an awesome speaker, a uh, friend of mine who I've known for several years. Uh, I've invited him to come speak at our school several times. He is the creator of Earthworm Jim. Have you guys heard of Earthworm Jim? No. no. Ruby. Crickets chirp. <laughs> He's also created a game called The Neverhood. He's oh. created a series called Cat Scratch for Nickelodeon. How many of oh. you guys remember that show? Oh, I was yeah. Yeah, and he's also created a number of graphic novels that were, several of them were optioned for films. Uh, one of them actually was optioned by Disney, and Hugh Jackman is attached. <coughs> attached. And he's also got a film uh, optioned from his book Cardboard that uh, 20th Century Fox optioned, and Tobey Maguire is attached, I believe, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. So he's done a you know, Jim, Jim, you know Ballerini? Ballerini's writing that script. <clears throat> attached means uh, they're attached to the project as it comes into fruition or as it is being made. So they're like the director or something like that? Yeah, they're, they're, yeah. they're kind of attached to it. But with all, uh, uh, with all that, I'm going to let Doug talk more about uh, what he's doing now. He's actually working for DreamWorks as a writer, but I'm going to let him uh, give a little spiel on that and tell us... Uh, about his inspiration and uh, why you should create. It's all you, Doug. Cool. Hey, what about the students? How, can I see the students? I want to be able to see the class for just for just a second. Is there any way you can walk, you can turn the camera around just to show me everybody? Hi, everybody. Hi. Yo. Hi. Yo. Hi. Hi. Yo. Here's a guy who's running the boom here. There's the boom man. Hello, boom. And then boom. Here's a couple more guys here. Oh, hi guys. Hello. So mostly the reason why I want to talk to your faces is I just want to know kind of how many of you uh, want to be writers. Like raise your hands. Yo. Yep. We have yeah, see you. I can see Santosh. Hold on. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> There's about seven or eight people, I think, right? Yes. Yeah. And I'm probably want to be a writer as well. He wants to be a writer too. And oh, good. And so probably just before we end here, I'll try and keep this down to about 30 or 40 minutes. But right before we end here, I'll have a quick question answer session. You all can can ask any question you want from me about how to how I write or how I make comics, or, you know, because I write TV shows, I write video games, I write comic books. And any one of you, you know, I always tell my friends that, you know, just about anybody can write. I don't know if you can write well, but you can write. And you can create your own stuff. And a lot of people, I think, they listen to, they see how hard it is to make something like a movie or a TV show or a comic book and they just give up. And that's kind of the first mistake that anyone makes about something that they're not very good at, let's say, is giving up. So number one, I want you to remember that if you really want to do something, you can't give up. And that's, and that's true for children. It's true for adults. It's true, you know, let's say that I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm a dad, I, I have four kids and I want to be a good dad. And some days I'm not a good dad. And on those days I have to remind myself not to give up. So it's really no different for writing, right? Is number one, don't give up. And then number two is you have to devote a lot of time and to develop your skill. So there's a lot of skills, in, you know, in writing of, learning how to tell a story, learning how to talk to other people, like read your story to other people and have other people read it and see if they understand what you're writing. And so that, cause it's communication. I'm trying to put a thought in my head into your head. And I'm trying to get you to see the world or characters uh, through my words, I'm trying to put those images in your head. That's all you do when you read someone else's work, be it a, whether if you read a comic or read a novel or read a paragraph or even read an email or a letter from a family member. When you read it, you're taking one of their ideas that was in their head and they use words to put an idea in your head. 
And that's really all you're trying to do is be better at that to more. And so you develop the skill of writing. It means you have to learn more vocabulary. You have to read a lot more books to learn the way people communicate. You study other people to see how people interact with each other. I know those are some skills that we can all develop and we can all figure out is uh, I think great writers are they observe other people very well. So they're good at seeing kind of what other people do. By the way, you yourself, uh, m many writers have been very terrible people, <laughs> like terrible at life, let's say. You don't. You, you just have to be a good good at observing other people. You don't actually have to go out and perform the conversation yourself. You just have to watch other people and be able to put it down into words. And then, so that's the biggest thing. And the, the third thing is you have to, so that's developing your skills. Well, how do you develop your skills? For that, I suggest two things. To develop your skills, you need to practice. And that's kind of obvious. And that's the hardest part is practicing because Usually when you have to practice, you have to do something over and over again when it's boring. So when it's when it's not stimulating or not fun to do, you have to still do it. Like it ought to occur to you while you're writing or drawing or whatever you're trying to get better at. You go, uh, hey, I'm bored at this. And so then you could choose to watch TV or watch a video game. The good writers instead choose and go, I'm bored, but I'm going to keep writing. And that's that's a big difference. So number one, you need to practice, practice your craft, practice your writing. And number two, you need a good mentor or a good hero or a good writer that you look up to and respect. And, and maybe you can even try to emulate the way they write. Like, let's say you like Tolkien for Lord of the Rings. Or maybe you like C.S. Lewis for Chronicles of Narnia. Or maybe you like Michael Crichton who wrote Jurassic Park. Uh, if you find writers that you really like the way that they write, even if you have to just, I would even say like copy a paragraph of theirs and just write a paragraph so you feel what it's like to put those words down and that sequence down. And you'll learn so much by writing that paragraph again in your own hand, not even changing a word. Later, when you want to learn other things and get better at it, you could actually put a paragraph in your own words from a favorite author like Tolkien and then compare and see how he hold to his story versus how you told your story. So that's kind of my overview on writing. The uh, the next thing on your stories that you need to know about, can they see this screen okay, Santosh? Okay. The next thing you got to do is I have my fancy yellow pad here. And uh, I, what I'm going to draw probably isn't very profound to any of you, but what I have here is how I write all of my stories. I have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Pretty, pretty profound, pretty mind blowing, right? It seems easy, but every story has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Every sentence has to have, so every sentence that I start, I've already started it, so now I'm probably in the middle of my sentence and I'm getting towards the end of my sentence and now I'm at the end. So it, it, when, you're, when you're born, you have a beginning. And then you live your life here. And then you die. You have an end. So everything is beginning, middle, end. Every TV show you watch has a beginning, middle, and end. And in short, you really don't have much of anything if you have no beginning, middle, and end. You know that the universe exists because it had a beginning. And if it didn't have a beginning, then it never would have come into being. So everything it's a, it is a requirement. And we know that in the universe and, and material world doesn't last forever, so it will have an end. And right now we're in the middle. So everything in the world, every sentence, every story, beginning, middle, end. Now here's my big, this is something I do that is pretty radical that probably not all other people do, but I, I really think it's important. I don't think you know 
that you have a good story until you have a good end. Like if you can't come to the end of your story and, and have your mind blown or make someone cry or make someone cheer or make a bizarre, amazing uh, comment, then I don't think you have a good ending. And so, so why would you, let's say that you're going to spend 10 years of your life writing a book, which is a long time. You spend the first, let's divide up uh, 10, uh, let's, let's say it's nine years. So you can go three years be beginning, be three years for your middle and three years for your end. So you're writing for three years on your beginning and then you're writing three years on your middle and then you come to the end and you realize it's a terrible story you've been writing. Sh you never should have started, right? Because you don't know if you should spend six years on something until you get to your end. So I say write your ending first. Because if you write your ending first, uh, let's go back to Star Wars, The New Hope, where Luke blows up the Death Star. And you say, this is about a, a farm boy who came from nowhere in space. And he had no... He, he had no advantage. His parents were killed and he was raised by his aunt and uncle. And at the end, he ends up blowing up the most powerful, giant, planetary weapon ever. That's your end. And you know that story is worth telling because that end is so great. So once you write your end, you know it's worth not only spending three years on but six years and it's worth spending nine years on figuring it out. So that's why I tend to write my endings first. Once I know, let's say that I want to do a Western. I know there's going to be cowboys in it. Well, I don't know if it's a story worth telling until I come up with the great Western ending. And so write your end first. And that'll tell you if your story is worth telling. So I'm going to give you an example of an end right now. This is going to be pretty simple, right? It's going to be kind of like Star Wars. I'm going to do my three acts here. Again, act one, act two, act three, beginning, middle, end, beginning, middle, end. I'm going to come up with my end. At the end, a terrible man who has lost his wife because she divorced him, a terrible man who lost his wife becomes good and gets her back. That's a happy ending, right? So here's, I'm going to write my end out. Uh, he becomes good and gets wife back. That's my end. Now, now after you've written your end, you don't write the, the middle, you write the beginning. So we're going to go back to the beginning. So at the, if at the end he becomes good, where do you think he should start at the beginning? Does he start good? No. Nope. You got to give him somewhere to go to tell you your story. So he's going to start bad. He's a bad husband. Maybe he's a cheater. Maybe he's just, he's critical. Maybe he's childish as a man. And so he, he loses his wife. So he bad, he's a bad guy, and he loses his wife. And I just want to real quick show you. So this is the beginning, and this is the end of my story. It's about a bad guy who loses his wife, and at the end, he becomes good and gets his wife back. That's your beginning and your end. And But I haven't told the story yet, right? I haven't, because what happens? How did it happen, right? How did it happen? It's like if you were watching this movie right now and you had lost your wife, you'd go, oh, I, and, then, and then you saw the end of it where he gets it back. You'd go, but how did you do it? Well, you know, what did you have to go through? Well, that's your middle. And your middle is going to be a series of steps that explain how your character got from the beginning to the end. And so you'd say, he's a bad guy who who, you know, who loses his wife. So he lost his wife. And at first he starts, he's just going to get, say, drunk all the time. You demonstrate that he's a drunk. He gets drunk all the time. 
And then maybe he goes to a therapist and, uh, and starts to learn how to talk better to his wife. And then he uh, spends his money on some jewelry for her. So he buys her some diamonds. And then he learns to write beautiful music. He's a romantic. And he learns how to arrange flowers. And then he uh, goes on a trip to Guatemala and, uh, and he uh, pr goes to a, a orphanage in Guatemala and he serves the children there and it changes his heart. And then he meets his wife again. He has become good and she comes back to him. So if I give you these steps, isn't it believable now that he could go from here to here? Yeah. 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 He went through this crashing drunkenness. He goes to a therapist. He buys her some jewelry. He learns about romance and beauty. And he goes to Guatemala and his heart has changed. This is the Groundhog Day premise right here. This is Bill Murray starts out as a jerk and no one wants to be with him and he's in love with Andy McDowell. He wants her, but he gets, and he gets stuck in the same day over and over again. And at first he's basically drunk and selfish and wants to kill himself. And then he slowly starts making friends and learning about life. He learns to play piano. He starts doing kind works for other people. He sees an old man die and it moves him at the end. He becomes good and he gets the girl. The end. Um, but I want you to start at the end. So that's my whole, you know, that's my big method on storytelling. And you can tell next time you watch movies or hear a story, pay attention to the end because we watch them forwards, right? But think about your favorite movies. Think about their endings. And you probably remember the endings very well. You always remember the end of Ghostbusters. In fact, you'll tend to, Remember the beginning and the end of things because the beginning is your setup and it's the most exciting part of the movie because you have, you, you're just now getting in the theater or whatever. And you, you can't believe what you're seeing or avatar, you know, and all the monsters are showing up and it's an amazing world and amazing setup. And then usually you remember the end because it's the big giant crisis that changes your main character and the middle are just kind of small details that just happen that are kind of, I think are there of them more as like, checking off boxes or going through points to justify your end. Okay. I just want to make sure that I'm answering any questions now. So are there any questions about writing that you want to know? Because if you ask a good question, then I'll know, I'll make sure that I can hit your topic. Hi, Josh. Is, uh, I'm Patrick. I'm a student here at MBA. I, I know you can't see, but you can hear me, can't you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Fine. I wanted to ask, like, uh, out of all the writing, um, what, um, like, um, what was the most toughest writing like thing that you've ever done before, like, like cat scratch or something like that? Because that's the thing that you were known for. Uh, the toughest one is, um, you know, I'm I'm writing a a three book series right now for Scholastic called Newts. And it is, a, it is a huge epic. It is very hard to write. So that's hard. Uh, Cat Scratch is hard to write because it's comedy, and comedy is always really hard to write. It's hard to be funny. So, uh, so comedy is really hard to write. And I'm, and I'm working on Veggie Tales right now, uh, and I write for that sometimes. And, and the comedy part of it is really hard. Hard to be funny. It's... Uh, you know, it's easy to be scary. I could do a horror horror stuff in my sleep. Uh, co comedy, I'm, I'm far more afraid of doing comedy than I am of doing horror. <laughs> well, would, would you be scared in the night? Would, would, you be, would you be afraid not to sleep or anything like that? Yeah, yeah. Well, so my projects keep me up all night all the time where I can't sleep. But it's, it's not fear. It's out of grinding my teeth, worrying how I'm going to pay my rent, right? <clears throat> <laughs> That's funny. Here is I'm grinding my teeth worrying on <laughs> John, I think had a question next. Um, uh, I had a uh, question regarding storytelling. Is it always uh, is uh, I noticed in some good stories uh, how uh, you, uh, some people would start their stories with like the ending events and then do, and then 
to continue this their story, they would do flashbacks. Is yeah. that a good way of telling the story, or that is a okay way to tell a story? It one one thing I don't like about it is if I if I'm going to put you on an adventure and let's say Sinbad, and I show you it at the beginning of my story, he's an old man. And, and he's going to tell you the story of how he fought the Cyclops. When, we, when he goes back to tell you, you know, remember this time, and when he shows him fighting the Cyclops, you already know he's going to survive it. Like when he starts telling you, and then I fought the Cyclops. What bugs me is you know that he won't die. So... To me, it, it gives away, to, it removes too much tension to have a character talk back on how he got that way. Um, a much more interesting form is when, so that wouldn't work so well for the action genre. It works better for something like uh, Amadeus. In Amadeus, you have Solieri, this, this composer who is against Mozart, who is now a deranged, crazy man in, a, in an insane asylum. And he is, he was once a great musician. And so you go, well, what happened to him? And then he goes back and tells his tale of how he met Mozart and how it was, you know, his anger at Mozart and his jealousy of him that drove him mad. So um, it, it's appropriate for certain stories where we, but that first image of that person, when you see them at the start, you have to ask, the whole audience has to be wondering how get that way. So it's probably a, a poor man or a guy in prison or a man who has lost everything or a man who has done it where it implies some bizarre story has happened. Or maybe it's a guy who uh, he married his aunt, which is gross, but he married his aunt. And you go, well, well, how did that happen? He goes, well, let me tell you the story. It'll all make sense to you when I tell you the story. And now I've got you on the hook. And you're like, what the heck would make a guy do that? You know? It can, it can be something really absurd at the start, and then your audience is on board going, you've heard the, um, oh, the sitcom is called How I Met Your Mother. You know that you know the guy has, got, has, has gotten this girl pregnant. You don't know who it is. You know that someone has met the girl's mother. And so it, it, it should make you wonder, who is it? Who is it? All right, next question. Yes, uh, I am Nikolai, and I, I, need a <laughs> I have a question when it comes to storytelling. Well, sure. does that have to be in, for TV animation? Does it have to be a Disney too? Star Wars Disney too as well? Does it have to be what? I'm sorry, does, for TV does it, animation? Do, does it have to start for at the end first or beginning? No, I, I would say that was just a, a, another question about is it okay to do that? In general, I don't, you know, in general, you write what's comfortable to you. I'm saying if you, and, and just remember, it has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And, the, and the, in general, if you want to, f I always feel more comfortable if I know the end first. Now, you may be comfortable writing, you know, without knowing what the end is. Uh, Stephen King writes all of his scary stories without knowing the end when he begins them. So other people do that. In TV, all of my stories that I write for TV, I always write the end first. So that's just me. It does, you don't have to do that, Nikolai. You do what's comfortable for you. But um, if you ever get stuck, or if you find out that your TV shows that you write, animated TV shows, don't seem to have much meaning or are hard to follow or don't have a big lesson in them, just try something different. Try writing them backwards. Go, go. Try writing the end first, and then go back and write your beginning. <clears throat> it's a structure thing. Go ahead. Aside from the the whole um, start from the end thing, do you have any other writing structures you prefer to use? I uh, another thing. I have another. I'll show you real quick. One more piece of advice, and these are kind of the basics of what I do. <clears throat> And it's based, once again, on beginning, middle, and end, right? So here it goes. I'm going to break up my pad into beginning, middle, and end. And so this is part one, part two, part three. It's also known as the beginning, the middle, and the end. It's also known as act one, act two, act three. 
All I would say is your beginning itself needs to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. So see, even your beginning is a three-act structure. And then when you're done with your beginning and you have completed your end of your beginning, you go to the middle. And your middle needs a beginning, middle, and end. Yeah, compartmentalize. This is very, and this is good pattern work and good rhythm work for putting structure into your stories. And then look, your end needs a beginning, middle, and end. And the idea is that you know, you have to know what your beginning is. Like this is about setting Luke up on his home planet. And you have to get him to a point that he's ready to go on his journey to go out and, and join, you know, the rebellion. So the end of that first act in Star Wars is that his parents, his, uh, his step-parents, his uncle, are killed by stormtroopers, right? Because the stormtroopers are looking for those droids. So you know this is going to be your end. So you write your end first. And so the stormtroopers kill Luke's dad. And then I know that he has nothing more to live for on that desert planet. And they're going to hire Han and Chewie to go fly out on adventures with Ben Kenobi. And he's ready to start that second act. And then during the second act is when he gets his training to become a Jedi. And we're slowly setting up where the it will end on him uh, uh, preparing to go to the Death Star and blow it up, which is going to be your final end. So I'm only saying beginning, middle, end, and then your beginning has a beginning, middle, and end. Just break it down into smaller pieces, and it's much easier to write this little chunk than to think about writing this whole giant story. It's so, you know, they're so complicated, and, and you might get frustrated, or you might be scared. I think you shouldn't be scared of writing just this. Let's say this is just one paragraph. It's three, sent three to five sentences. Is that actually all that different from something style I use? So it's actually pretty nice that something that other people use. So thank you for that. Sure. Adrian, Adrian was next. Yes. Well, let's see. How, about this. Um, how do you find the drive for a character? Like, what drives them to do what they do? In the first sort of stories. What what drives my characters to do what they do is usually they stand for something that is important, okay? Because your story needs, you know, you want it to be about people doing things that are important, right? You, a story worth telling, I should say. So what drives a character? He, maybe he's about freedom or maybe he's about not killing people or maybe he's about, um, um, putting people together to get married, or maybe he's about going back in time to save the world from destroying itself, or maybe he's about stopping racism. So wouldn't you say that each of those things are pretty important things? So, so your character ought to be about something important. So I would just ask you, what is important? And, and when you answer that question, that's probably a real good thing for your, your story to be about or something that motivates your character, right? So, and let's write it backwards now. So now you're at the end and you know what your main character is going to be fighting for, that one important thing at the end. And now we write it backwards. We go back at the beginning. He's not fighting for that important thing. It may be that he has lost his way. It may be that he hasn't learned about it yet. He doesn't even know it exists. It may be that he's a bad guy and he needs to be redeemed and turned good. But at the beginning, he's not fighting for it. That's Avatar, you know, with the big 12-foot tall blue people. Is the, Marine, the Marine is in a wheelchair. And number one, he's incapable of fighting because he's in a wheelchair. And number two, he is not aware of these blue aliens that they're amazing people. And so during the second act, right, he's going into the blue bodies and he's going into their tribe. And by the end, he is fighting for those blue. He's fighting for something important for their freedom, for the freedom of innocent people. 
And so uh, lots of stuff changes in that story. But what the writer thinks is important does not has not changed. And so you're the writer, and so you have to think of what's important. And that's... Go ahead. I see what you mean. So if you want something that stays constant, constant as what they want or what they think they want, and then right. again, something has got to change. What? Yeah. Kind of what your whole story is basically about. And then you kind of know what a bad guy is, right? If a good guy wants freedom, what does a bad guy want? To make sure that they're fighting. Yeah, he wants tyranny. He's a dictator. He loves slavery. And you have an, and then you have natural a natural enemy to show up in your scenes and give your story, you know, somewhere to go. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, I see what you mean. Yeah. I think John had a question. Yes. yes. Uh, out of all the projects you've written, what is your favorite project that you've ever written? I think one of the best I've done is I did cardboard last year, which is a scholastic book that uh, is being made into a movie by uh, Chris Wedge, who did Ice Age and Epic, is directing that one. But uh, Cardboard is one of my favorites. I, I really like the structure. I feel like I really figured something out. Another one I, I like of mine is an earlier book called Tommy Source Rex, about a boy and his T-Rex. So those are my favorites. Next question. Carlos has a question. Uh, what was your inspiration for Cat Scratch? Because you know that was like one of the one of my favorite shows. The inspiration for Cat Scratch was my four cats. I had four cats at home, and it's uh, Simon, Waffle, Mister Black, and Gordon. And Simon died before the show ever got made. So the show ended up being about <coughs> Waffle, Mister Black, and Mister Blick, and Gordon. And, so, and they really were based on my real cats, like their personalities was similar to that. So that, that was one inspiration. The other one is I really love Warner Brothers cartoons, the old Bugs Bunny cartoons. Um, for a cat scratch, what, was, what kind of cat is, is Waffle? Uh, the, my, the real life cat was half Siamese, so he had a little bit of striping, you know, on the top of his head. And he had the big blue eyes that were kind of cross-eyed, like some, you know, Siamese have those big, big eyes, and they kind of look off real strange. And he was part, I think he had some Persian in him because he was real, had thick hair. So it was like weird to see some of the Siamese markings with his thick hair. And he really was the, the kind of airhead one of the bunch. <laughs> he kind of ran into walls, and he'd stare, stare at himself in the mirror. And so I... Made Waffle really like that in the cartoon. Doug, are you allowed to talk a little bit about Veggie Tales, or not, not much yet? Yeah, we're we're getting to where we can talk about it more and more. Veggie Tales is a Netflix show that we're working on. Um, I work at Big Idea here in Tennessee, and it is for a DreamWorks. Uh, DreamWorks is kind of my my boss out in LA and the whole project is for Netflix and the show is going to come out this Thanksgiving where they will release five episodes every couple of months and they're going to be coming out for the next three years. You'll see a ton of new VeggieTales episodes and they're uh, 22 minute episodes that, com that are comprised of two 11 minute shorts. And we just went for a real funny take on Bob and Larry and they still have, um, faith-based messages, but I'm a huge fan of Warner Brothers, so there's lots of real broad physical comedy goofing around and having fun with these characters. So I'm real excited about that. I'm sorry? I mean, like, wash, wash and stretch. Wash and stretch. In fact, those are the big animation principles that, uh, that Disney you know, helped develop with the nine old men. Is there squash and stretch? which means a character goes, right, he squashes. And that's what a great animation tool. Another one is called overlapping action, which means this is overlapping action when something overlaps. So the, the, it stops and then it overlaps a little bit. Overlapping action. And there's, and there's basically uh, eight animation principles that animation runs under. And we try and hold on to those. And because we're doing a 3D, it's done in 3D. Uh, CG, 
we like having the characters animate uh, using those old animation principles. Mm -hmm. Any last words of advice, Doug, that you can give to our students? I think, you know, my advice to you is you ought to do it, is you really ought to take your writing seriously and go for it. Uh, if you want to, I'm saying, <clears throat> if you want to be a writer, then you need to write, and you need to write every day and write constantly. If you want to be a cartoonist, you have to make cartoons and draw every day. If you want to be a director, get out your little camera phone and shoot movies and direct something every day. So you don't become a writer by talking about it. You become a writer by sitting down and doing it. And I'll tell you that there's a, there are some people, and, it, and this might even be you telling yourself this. You might be telling yourself, I can't do it. And I'll tell you that is not simply not true. I see too many people do it. I didn't come from some amazing giant, you know, amazing background. It's I came from, uh, you know, a farm town and, you know, barely got a high school education and a, and a college education. And it really was like my hard work year after year and getting a little lucky. So you can do it. That's the main message I want you to go home and think to yourself. But it can't just be a, a wish or a dream. You can do it. It has to be you sitting at a table and you writing every day. You can do it. All right? So who here knows they can do it if they work on it every day really hard? I can All right. Do it. Good I can job. Do it. Yeah. I want to see. I want to see hands up. Who here is going to try doing some writing tonight before they go to bed? How about we put your hand? Let me see you guys. How about you write... How about one, three sentences of a beginning, middle, end, right? And write that third sentence first and then write two more. About three pages. I'll give you one better. How about three books? You're an achiever. Hey, hey, guess what I'm going to be doing today? Yeah, I'm going to be, I'm going to do some writing tonight too because I got to get better at it also. That's right. You, you guys can do it. All right. Thanks for having Good one. Thank you. 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 Thank you.